Chris Kurzik from AES. Welcome back. A little bit about our company, what we do. We provide equipment re-rating and fitness for service um, services and uh, reliability and safety studies, short-term staffing that we've been providing, and uh, training and certification, materials and welding studies and investigations, and estimating and economic evaluations. And uh, we've been getting into environmental studies like carbon uh, footprint and emission studies. So let's dive into what we're going to work on today. This series of videos, our goal is to go through some of the codes in ASME and look at how they deal with metal and well fatigue reliability problems and, and how they deal with it. But we thought we would maybe back this up a little bit to, to provide some more background, more what they would teach at a university, uh, the theory behind you know fatigue. And so uh, we're, we're going to, these series, this first set of videos will be talking about, you know, defining really what fatigue is, just backing things up, causes of fatigue, stages of fatigue, you know, stage one, uh, and what propagation and non-propagation is, because, for example, non-propagating um, cracks, right, they can go for, forever, right, and service, and it's not an issue. So you know, when to decide propagating and non-propagating. Then there's stage two and stage three uh, cracks. And the factors that affect weld fatigue, uh, weld fatigue nucleation, weld fatigue performance and testing, weld procedures, weld processes and consumables and gases, post-weld heat treat, and some issues with regards to you know how we can deal with you know fatigue and welding design some tricks that uh, that I've seen I've read about and I have actually done over the years and basically this uh, presentation we're going to talk about the first four topics that you see here so let, let's let's uh, let's dive into this fatigue fatigue the best definition I found was that the flux it's a the fluctuation in magnitude and direction of a load that's acting on a, a component or an engineered item or a structure that adversely affects the component's life compare, and in comparison to that of like a statically loaded equipment um, that's seeing you know a constant load. And this adverse effect of this loading fluctuation on the life of a component relative to a static component is called fatigue. Why is the life of a component reduced under fatigue? Fair question. It's primarily caused by the premature fracture of a component. And, and the, it's primarily caused by early nucleation, which is the initiation of some kind of crack from a flaw. And we'll, we'll get into that detail further. And then it's accompanied by the fast growth of cracks in the areas of high stress concentrations. ...is caused by the abrupt change in cross-section of the part and the presence of defects in the form of a crack or blow holes or you know, incomplete fusion and any, some kind of defect. The factors causing fatigue. Factors affecting the fatigue life at, at, at each stage is the service load condition. So this is, you know, each stage means the nucleation, the crack growth, and then the final, you know, uh, catastrophic crack. So the service load condition, what's happening, the loading, the mechanical properties, and the metallurgical properties, these are pretty, you know, affect every stage. And of course, the surface properties. And, and in the environment, because 
you know, if it's if it's a, an ocean type environment, then you can get the synergetic effects of, you know, corrosion and the crack growth, you know, working working uh, together to to uh, enhance the their fatigue rates. So let's look at the stages of fatigue. So mechanical components under fatigue load conditional conditions generally take on three steps, okay? So the first stage is called the nucleation of cracks or crack-like discontinuities. And this is all the fundamentals associated with fracture mechanics that, um, that you see. And the second one is the stable crack growth and we'll get more into that later. And the first of all is stage three, next is the final, is the catastrophic and unstable fracture. Now let's go more into the stages of fatigue. Here's a diagram of a cross section of a sample. And you can see up there at the top is the surface crack or the nucleation site, which the, the, the in theory, that's the, the where the crack initiates. And if you were to look at the, that, you can take a look at something called the beach marks and you can look backwards and you can see where the initial flaw is. So, so it, it will find, you know, the location where it's failed, where it's where the crack begins. Next, we have something called this, the uh, stable crack growth and it's characterized uh, by all the beach marks. So, you know, every time it cracks, there's a, a, a beach mark that's created and it, it grows away from the, uh, the surface nucleation site. And then the final stage is uh, the catastrophic failure. And, and this is called, you know, stage three. And, and, and the, uh, depending on the toughness of the part, uh, you know, if it's cast iron or, you know, very ductile, you know, um, quenched and tempered material, um, the size of that fracture zone will, will vary. So we'll look at this graph here. This is, a, you know, a classical graph for, for how, you know, a crack progresses. On the, on the left side, we have here the crack growth rate expressed in, in, in terms of, a, of, of a, a derivative of the change in crack rate in terms of the number of cycles. And the other one is called the stress intensification or intensity factor range and expressed as a delta K in terms, of, this is in metric, um, and basically, the, it's divided into three of the zones as we go through. So, you know, we talked about earlier about the surface crack nucleation, stage one. Then we've got the stage two, where we have this uniform crack growth. And you can see this equation over here uh, in the middle, and it it's, shows it at a fairly constant rate. And there's a relationship in fracture mechanics called Paris, Paris Law. And it tries to describe that, that, that characteristic crack growth. And, and it's quite valuable because now um, if you have a crack detected at a certain point, you can predict, you know, um, how far along you need to, you can go until you need to uh, worry about that crack because you, you definitely don't want to get into you know, the fracture stage three. So the stage two is, you know, the point where, you know, reliability engineer would, would kind of look at this area and make a judgment of, you know, when he needs to donate, that crack needs to be repaired or that equipment needs to be taken out of service. So that, that's basically the fundamentals with, with that. So the next slide, oh yeah, is, stage one, which is, uh, I've put in a box there, and this is the one we're gonna look at in more detail in the next couple slides. So stage one, so we have a surface crack nucleation stage is primarily influenced by surface properties. So 
the surface properties can include, you know, the roughness, the hardness, yield strength, and the ductility of the engineered item. The engineered component, the smooth surface, requires a smooth surface. So uh, the surface nucleation stage one. So let's talk more about that. So at a micro level, uh, the def we have a micro level deformation and it's part of you know fracture mechanics and there, there's a there's a term called slip which refers to how a defect travels through you know crystalline material and um, and basically nucleation occurs because the slips build up uh, in the presence of fluctuating loads so the fluctuating loads have to be high enough for for this slip to occur but it does occur and it, it nucleates at the weakest point so um, and so surface irregularity so if that surface of that component isn't perfectly smooth and it's got some stress risers and, and a, you know a site for stress concentration and then you're going to have some issues uh, and if we if we continue the slip to you know a fluctuation load fluctuation we can produce a crack like surface uh, discontinuity and that's when our nucleation begins a rule of thumb just for thought is is well, i've read this on uh in in uh, journals and, and in textbooks they say the first crack nucleation takes place about 10 to 20 percent of the total fatigue cycle life um, I, I, in my experience, I don't know whether that's that's true, but that's what I've I read in literature. If you have any thoughts on that, I would love to hear that, and we can have some uh, more discussions on that topic. So, crack uh, fatigue crack nucleation mechanism is based upon. Um, micro level deformation by slip and there's influencing factors here first of all we talk you know about surface irregularities so you know if we have surface irregularities then we're going to increase our, our, our stress concentration is going to increase you know we, the, the factors are like ductility if we can ach achieve you know by by heat treating um, a a steel with high toughness with with uh, you know a very fine grain structure then we're going to have a tough material a lot of ductility and that will arrest the, the the nucleation phase and prevent a crack from growing if it, the material is stuck on makes sense right and then you know if we have the, the yield strength also has a great deal to do with the um the, this the the site nucleation as well and of course the hardness at the surface and there's strategies to you know to make that surface harder so that the the um the crack will not initiate so easily so there, there's a few things that we talk about delayed uh nucleations delaying the nucleation stage so to enhance the fatigue life you know we can reduce the the stress concentrations due to surface irregularities and we can achieve that by you know grinding and lapping and polishing that um, uh, the the surface of that material i remember back in university we would polish samples in our fatigue testing equipment and we had a contest and we would uh, uh, one of the strategies was to to polish that sample as much as we can to to reduce that so that because to reduce the um, the, the chance of new early nucleation and so um, you know to extend the life of that sample and it was a really neat you know um, exercise we had done in the lab so also we can increase the surface hardness and the yield strength at the surface so you you know you want a hard surface right but then you want the ductility you know on the inside right 
So let's talk more about the delayed nucleation. So, you know, we can reduce this, the surface ductility a little bit more about that by, by a process called carburization, which is the introduction of, of carbon to the surface. And you can, uh, the method, you can use a gas, like an industrial gas process. And, and uh, in a lab, I remember we, we used, we, carp, we pack carbon. And that what that did is it increased the, the carbon content of the steel and of course the, the low alloy steel. And basically the higher the carbon content that gets absorbed, the, the material gets harder and, and the first, you know, uh, one thousandths or a couple thousandths of an inch. And, um, and that's enough to, to delay the onset of nucleation cracking for an extent. And uh, that's the strategy. And nitriding is, I've only seen that done in a, in a um, industrial site. I've, I've, we've done that as well. And that's proven to be very effective in, you know, in a delaying of cracking. And also the third one is, is shot painting, you know, which is basically ball hammering, hammer, um, and, and increasing the surface hardness. And we'll learn later that uh, that also is effective in uh, reducing re residual stress, but that's another part of our presentation that we can talk about. I hope that you found this presentation useful and valuable to you. This was provided by Athabasca Engineering Solutions. We'd love to hear your feedback and, and your thoughts on further videos. And we'd love to hear from you. Maybe we can do some business. Please subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing. Take care for now.